We know that Israel is going to fall in 722 BC to Assyria. And even after the kingdom has fallen to Assyria, there will be a few puppet kings before the Assyrians totally move in and do some ethnic cleansing, I guess, relocate them. There's intermarriage, there's relocation, and that's the end of that. But what is intriguing to me is in the passage for our focus today, God tells Israel how much he loves Israel. And a few years later, they fall to the Assyrians. It is interesting. It's like telling your children how much you love them and then allowing whatever consequence to come, to come. You can preach to them and convince them how much you love them, but you can't necessarily change their heart. And those of us who are parents know that that can be a struggle sometimes. Or <laughs> <laughs> It's a struggle, no matter how much you love them. <laughs> okay. In terms of the history, the king that you want to focus on for this period is Jeroboam II. And he was king for a long time, 41 years. Part of it was a co-regency with either a father or a son. But he is probably, I want to say, the greatest king that Israel had after the kingdom was divided. In fact, what happened was that he regained territory. So they said that in Jeroboam's time, the victories he won made the kingdom as large as when David was in charge. They had ceded, C-E-D-E-D, some territory, but they had regained it because he had good military skills, or it was a good military during the time of his tenure. But 41 years is a long time. The issues are usually political, and you're creating alliances with those around you. And as he expanded the territory and conquered Syria, the Assyrians are to the north and to the east. So the Assyrian Empire is expanding south, and here is the king of Israel trying to expand north, to regain territory that Israel once controlled. He's also trying to expand to the south. And he has some conflict with the king of Judah. The king of Judah actually seems to come against the king of Israel. And the king of Israel says, a little branch coming against a big tree. A thistle of Lebanon coming against a cedar of Lebanon. But there are a lot of political maneuverings in this period. Judah is also reconquering territory, so Judah manages to control those regions around Judah. The Gaza area, which is where the Philistines hung out, Ammon and Edom. So both kingdoms are expanding, so to speak. And there is a sense that they're trying to get back to our former glory. So we're around 750-something BC. That's the political scenario. The economy is doing really well. Politically and economically, Israel is doing well. Spiritually and morally, they're in decline. In fact, we're told that all of the kings of the northern kingdom were bad kings. Several of the kings of the southern kingdom are good kings. And if you look at the list on the left-hand side, Joash, Amaziah, and Uzziah, they're all considered to be good. Judah was having issues too, because all the kings were not always good. But the three kings listed there for a period of, I'd say, 100 years are good kings. And the kings listed on the side for Israel for a period of 80 years. Not so good kings. All bad kings. By spiritual and moral standards. But the main issue is that Israel has fallen in love with the Baals. They're worshipping the Baals. The gods of fertility. <coughs> they actually believe that you can bribe the gods. The more you give to the gods, the more prosperity the gods give to you. So they've fallen into Baal worship. Remember that they had not eradicated the Canaanites when they moved in to conquer the land, and God had said to get rid of everybody. The Canaanites remained in the land, and the Baals were the gods of the Canaanites. You probably remember Jezebel. Her father was king of the area over here, Tyre and Sidon, and they were big Baal worshippers. So she brought this Baal worship when she married Ahab, and Ahab gave his itself to that idolatry and the whole kingdom um, of course there were some minor small players like I said last week who were trying to do the right thing but they are insignificant in history's notes and uh, the power structure the priests and the kings and the royalty are the ones who are going off and doing this idolatry so that's a little bit of the context so if I say this is around the 750s let me put 755 or so BC and 722 BC the Assyrians are going to overtake, I'm going to say, another 30 years. Most people familiar with the 
prophecy of Hosea. We'll remember how it begins in chapters 1 and 2. God told the prophet to go and find this prostitute and make her his wife. And he had either one or two or three children with her. She had three children, according to the scriptures. She was still prostituting, so we hope the children are his. At least one is his, but anyway. They had some strange names, too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, Hosea is put to a fantastic test by God. Go and find this woman who is a prostitute and marry her. And the point is that this is a picture of Israel's prostitution. And God is saying to Israel, you're prostituted with the bells. I have provided for you and I'm your husband, so to speak. But you're prostituted. In chapter 11, the analogy changes from husband, wife, to father, son. If you notice the title for today's session, the Old Testament prodigal son. The good thing about the story of the prodigal son is that he came home. Israel does not come home. Hence, 30 years later, the Assyrians conquer the kingdom. I say conquer, but there's always this sense of who is really in charge and how are you subservient to another one. Because I said that around 730-something is when the Assyrians actually took over, but they pretty much destroyed them in 722 because the last few kings in Israel were not real kings. Well, Hosea, he was a puppet king. So that's a little bit more of the context. I'm going to read from the session outline. Israel has prostituted itself to the Baals. God has sent several prophets to tell them that what they're doing is inappropriate and they need to come back. They do not come back. And the kingdom falls. The Old Testament prodigal said, In his book, The City of God, Augustine called the book of the Twelve, the Minor Prophets. Up until that point, it was called the Book of the Twelve. He was referring to the small size of these books by comparison with the major prophetic books. In the Jewish canon, these works are arranged in what is thought to be chronological order. Those from the period of Assyria's rise to power, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah, those written about the time of the declining Assyrian power, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and those dated from the post-exilic era, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So those would be to the kingdom of Judah rather than the kingdom of Israel. The prophet Hosea frequently used the imagery of courtship to describe the relationship between Israel and God. He repeatedly referred to Israel's time in the wilderness as an example of a time when Israel trusted the Lord. In today's passage, the illustration of a parent-child relationship is used. As a child depends upon the parent, Israel depended upon the Lord. The Lord taught Israel to walk in those early days. Hosea's word pictures powerfully communicate something about the relationship between Israel and the Lord. As a caring parent, the Lord continued to seek Israel. But as a rebellious child, Israel sought its own way in the world. Regardless of the cultural differences and familial relationships between Hosea's time and ours, Hosea's illustration still proclaims the good news that the Lord is ready to welcome back rebellious children. Fanny Crosby came to mind in her song, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Verse 2 of that song is the one I chose to go with the session today. I think it well explains what Israel is doing in its relationship with God. Verse 2 of the song says, Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he will forgive if they on him believe. And that becomes the application for today. Uh, We might know individuals who need to be pleaded with. Who need to be told that Jesus loves. And it's incumbent on us to do something about it. Fanny Crosby says, even though they are slighting him, he is still waiting for them to come back. 
waiting the penitent child to receive. Our task is to plead with them gently and earnestly because we have the good news that Jesus will indeed forgive. Dear God, we love you and we appreciate your patience with us even as we sometimes do things that you have not called us to do. Thank you for the grace that is given. May we incline our hearts toward obedience and may we be willing to accept the consequences of disobedience. Not too harsh, but certainly a reminder that you've called us to walk in the right way. And though the temptations of the world can be great, help us to remember whose we are. May we be faithful, may we be true, may we be obedient to your word. And may this lesson help us in that walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Question number one. God called Israel, the northern kingdom, his son. And uh, obviously before the kingdom was divided, if you go back to Exodus chapter 4, you will see him referring to the entire nation as his son. He's just brought them out of Egypt, and they're in the wilderness. And that's the first reference to where God calls Israel his son. But the more he called Israel, the more Israel rejected him. In verse 2, he said, It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. Why do you suppose Israel did not realize that it was God who healed them? The Lord rescues, but over the generations, people forget. They don't associate the benefit that they're experiencing right now with the hand of the Lord 100, 200, 300 years ago. People have short memories. And the Israelites are a good example of having short memories. The Lord would rescue them or care for them in, in very obvious ways. And the next day, figuratively speaking, the next day, they would say, Lord, why did you do anything for us? Have you forgotten about us? The next time there was some trial, they would say to the Lord, you've forgotten all about us. Aren't you going to help us? The Lord would rescue them. And a week later, they would say, Lord, why didn't you do something to help us? They had, they're so like us. They had short, they had short memories. Yes. Another thought that comes to my mind is that the parents were not sharing the history with the kids. And, and I think that that's important because God had given them strict instruction to do that. So he uh, knew that that was a failing on the part of humans. Yes. I, um, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I do think people can get too comfortable sometimes and that you know, it might make it easier to forget, you know, that God has done something for you. At the end of the day, when you are going through hard times, you're more likely to call on God. Right. When things are going really well, you tend to look at yourself and say, I look pretty cute, don't I? Right. <laughs> you turn the focus on yourself when times are good, and you turn to God when times are bad. Because scripture does tell us, you know, call on me in the day of trouble. But don't call on me when things are going well. So there's this sense of God as a rescuer, a savior. And ultimately, I think this separated the idea of needing God to rescue and help from worshiping God because they turned the worship to the veils. This is after Ahab and Jezebel, etc. So now they're looking down the road and this idolatry is everywhere. Every hundred yards on every hill, there was an altar to the bells. The visual contact. You can see where the bells are being worshipped. You can see people bringing gifts and putting at the altars to the bells. You're participating in it. That's your everyday life. Bring an offering to the Bells. That's the worship, as far as they're concerned. And the more you give to the bells, the more prosperity you get. That's not God's calculus. And that can be... So let's think of children who have two households they can live in because of some circumstance. And one set of householders treats them with more largesse, <laughs> giving them more than another household. I could say parents, but it could be grandparents as well. Guess where the kids are going to want to hang out? Where they get more stuff. Right. 
And this is part of the issue. That they saw the temples and the altars to the bells in their everyday existence. They saw people making these offerings and they felt that the more you give, the more you get. Prosperity kind of idea. And that became the focus of their worship. You can't see God in the same way you can see these altars to the bells. Were the Israelites, in fact, benefiting from their worship of Baal? In their minds, they were. If the theology... It, I mean, were they winning battles against the enemy? Were they, uh, well, Jeroboam were they had expanded the, the kingdom. So were the crops growing? Were they, it was uh, economic prosperity. Were the cows reproducing? The cows were reproducing. <laughs> you know, times were good. <laughs> times were good, so they associate this largesse, this goodness, with their worship of the bales. And God is not pleased because the spiritual decay is occurring. Uh, verses, let me read verse 3 again. It was I, well, verse 2 says, they sacrificed to the bales, they burned incense to images. Verse 3, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. Sometimes the child doesn't remember who helped him to walk because the child's mind is like not yet developed. And sometimes as a parent, you know, you plead with your children. You say, you know, all the sacrifices I made for you. And the child is saying, uh, I can't remember any of that. And that was your responsibility anyway. So you get no credit for what you did. That's why you had children, so you could raise them correctly. And Israel is certainly in the same vein. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. Why is Ephraim mentioned? Ephraim was the largest tribe. And therefore, that's just another substitute for Israel in terms of the language. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I want to keep going to verse 5, and then we'll take a couple of questions on this. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. Every translation doesn't do that. Um, the New King James says, I, led, I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. To them, I was like the one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Now, this is the newer NIV that goes in this direction where it says, I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek. And the older NIV basically talked about removing a yoke, taking the bit out of its mouth and removing the yoke. So if you do have a copy of the older NIV, you'll notice that the analogy has changed here. But the commentary on... That verse in the older NIV alludes to this idea of lifting a child to the cheek. Because they said it's not clear how to translate this particular sentence. And the New King James Version says, in verse 4, I was with them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. Again, I don't have enough clarity on which translation is the better translation. But I like the idea of if we are using a parent-child image, lifting the child to your cheek. is certainly consistent with the idea. You're trying to show the child love, and you're being a comforter. How is it possible, question two, that Israel did not realize that it was the Lord who healed them? They were blind to the fact that God was doing this. They thought that Baal was providing this increase. Again, you have to put the blame on the leadership. The priests aren't doing what they ought to do. But let me take that back. A lot of what the priests did was, can I say bloody and not sound like I'm swearing? Receiving sacrifices, burning offerings, etc. So a lot of the priests were not doing things that were very different from what the pagan priests were doing. As you visually see what's going on, people are bringing sacrifices and offerings to the altar. As a result... However, every seven years, this is... I've been sitting here thinking there has to be a breakdown in the priesthood. Mm -hmm. Because every seven years, the priests were supposed to bring all of Israel together and read to them Leviticus. So that they would know the law of the Lord. 
they would know the consequences of the blessing and, and not blessing as opposed to cursing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, parents had a responsibility too, but so did the priest. Mm -hmm. And so what, it was more than just the sacrifice. But in that time frame, they should have, the Israelites should have been brought together um, whether it was by community or whatever, and had Leviticus read to them, mm -hmm. so that they would, they would always know, they would always have God's covenant before them. I don't want to put you on the spot. Were you here last Sunday? Yes. What was the sermon? <laughs> Seven years is a long time. Seven years is a week is a long time. <laughs> but it was, it was intended that. The ch it would bring the children. It wasn't just parents. It was whole families mm -hmm. that would come together every seven years. And then you should be living out, because obviously seven is a perfect number. But, but you saw my analogy seven days ago. Yeah. Somebody stood up and gave a sermon for 25 minutes. I'll remind you what it was if you want me to. But <laughs> So as was mentioned earlier, short memories. You see worship of two kinds occurring. And unless someone is explaining to you that this one is not real and this one is real, but you see the people in this group getting prosperity and the people over here having hard times, I think they'll have what? It's over here. That's the temptation. I think the real temptation is what's easy. Right. That's the real temptation. Mm -hmm. Doing. Being obedient to God is not always easy, especially when you see people taking things to bail and seeming to prosper. Um, how hard is it for us sometimes to see people that are not nice people prosper? Um, and, and you sit back and say, why? You know, I'm not prospering like that. But, it, but that doesn't have anything to do with my walk with God. But I think it's because what's easy. And it's easy, it was easier for them to, especially when you have leadership coming down, uh, worshiping the Baals. Well, last Sunday was the first missionary journey, Paul going to Cyprus. Right. Um, Barnabas. Barnabas. Going to Cyprus and then on to the Right. <laughs> I should have done that. Has the law been rediscovered yet? Sorry? Has the law been rediscovered yet? So, no. So, they, if, had, so they, had, they hadn't heard the law read right. in years. That was the breakdown of the priesthood. But I, I hope you get the picture of... Remember, nothing good was happening in the Northern Kingdom. As far as the political leadership was concerned, there wasn't a lot of spirituality. All of the kings of the Northern Kingdom are listed as bad kings. Did you listen to the two comments that were just made? The one comment is saying every seven years this should have been read. And then the other comment was, has the law been rediscovered yet? Exactly. That is just mind blowing. <coughs> the breakdown of the future. The question is, why are we asking, has the law been rediscovered? Did someone come and take the law from them? Or did the priesthood and those who were charged to make sure that it was read, once they toss it out, like you said maybe a couple weeks ago, the people are just trying to survive. The people are just, they're very simple. They're the people. And so once the leadership moves off, once the, let's say that the, the priesthood, the church, moves off with the enemy, yeah. then what do the people do? The people are not educated. The people follow along and go with what is expedient, what works, because the law is no longer being read. Right. Think about that. Imagine... If in 2020, the Bible disappeared, people just stopped using it all together in the church. In 25 years from now, our children or grandchildren are saying, has the Bible been rediscovered yet? <laughs> that, that is mind-blowing when you think about what really went missing from their lives. Wow. Yeah. I have a simpler analogy. You better watch out for those officers. <laughs> I have a simpler analogy. When you do not bury yourself in the word, but you come and expect that the half an hour of exposition, or whatever you get, is going to sustain you for the week. It's easy for itching ears to hear the wrong things.
It's easy for the speaker to avoid the difficult passages and just preach on the stuff that excites us. And we see it happening. I've heard of two preachers who say they will never preach a negative message. Televantists, two of them said, oh, encourage the people. If you're always being encouraged along these lines and you're not being taught and disciplined and reminded of what God really wants from you, then you start to view this thing as easy. So the morality that had gone, we can look at our own world and say, well, you know, a lot of compromise. Thankfully, I do hear the word sin mentioned pretty much every Sunday, but there are churches where that's taboo. You don't mention sin. Because... It messes with what's going on. So you say what makes people comfortable. They drive out of the parking lot. They forget everything you said, but they have a good feeling. You know, with this being available to everybody, cheap, 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 mm-hmm. nobody's going to have an excuse. Yeah. When our meetings used to have specific themes, mm-hmm. like holiness and salvation, yeah. At least there was some sense of what the meeting was about and what the purpose of the meeting, of a meeting was. So now we have, I don't want to say mishmash, but we have loss of focus, multiple foci, and therefore, where are you looking? We're not exactly clear where we are looking. So it's a feature of the times. Maybe at the beginning we can say this service is a salvation focused service, or whatever the case might be, but I don't know, it's hard. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with necessarily going to this kind of, we're not announcing what kind of service it is, but I do want to point out that it's a, it's an accommodation for the times that we live in mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's an accommodation for where we are right now. Because mm-hmm. there may be other countries where they still have a very clear, hey, today this is holiness right here, and this is going to be the salvation service. But think about that small accommodation. You take the vector, you, you just turn it just a little bit. And then 50 years from now, we're so far away from the Lord. And, you know, let's say one other thing. I'm ashamed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I remember when I lived in Pittsburgh, I used to drive by this big Salvation Army um, installation. It was like this huge building in downtown Pittsburgh. I would drive by it all the time, and I'd see the Salvation Army. I never made the connection that the salvation in the Salvation Army, and I was going to church, you know, three, four days a week, was salvation, like come to Jesus, salvation. So combine those two things together. People who have no sense of what this thing is, and then they come and participate but don't know. And then the the organization or the church or the the Israelites themselves veering away just a little bit from some of these clear demarcations, like reading the law every seven years or, you know, making something holiness and the other thing evangelistic or going out and doing these um, open air meetings, whatever those accommodations are. And then, you know, it's a hundred years from now, who knows what the church will look like, not just this church, any church. If Jesus tarries. Hopefully he won't. Mm-hmm. I want to get to verse 4 in question 4 to make sure that we understand <laughs> we understand where the change in interpretation has occurred but it is not necessarily a change in interpretation it's just a different interpretation that is not clear to us reading a translation of the Hebrew hundreds of years later verse 4 again I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like the one who lifts a little child to the cheek. And I bent down to feed them. And again, the New King James said, I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. Here's what the commentary said. The text likely returns to the earlier image of a parent-child relationship thus depicting a loving parent who lifts up a fallen child to the parent's cheek and stoops down to feed the child. The double movement of lifting up and bending down paints a remarkable portrait of the Lord's humble coming to where his people were for the sake of bringing them up from slavery. This depiction redefines all that the people of God could ever imagine about the use of power and sovereignty, and it says that you see a similar language in chapter 13. Again, the 
analogies here. Whether it is removing the yoke and bringing comfort to a farm animal at the end of a work day, or lifting a child and bringing comfort to the child because the child is needing the comfort, God is presenting himself as one who brings comfort, who lightens our burden, who gives us comfort. And the whole sad part about it, he says, <clears throat> and let them with gentle cords. So if you go back to the farm animal idea, you're leading the animal with gentle cords. It is not... Sometimes when you're trying to lead a farm animal to get it to do work, it is not easy. You're dragging the animal or whipping the animal. You're forcing the animal to do things the animal does not want to do. He says, I'm leading you with gentle cords. Compassion. Cords of human kindness. I'm not sure how the word human get in there, but one translation says that the original word there is Adam. Because Adam means human. So, with cords of kindness on the Adamic, of the Adamic kind, with ties of love. And he explains how he is to them like a good parent. So the question I said was to what was he referring? And I think that in the leading of them, you go back to out of Egypt. So go back to the analogy in the, the beginning when he calls him his son for the first time, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. They had not worshipped God per se, but when he brought them out of Egypt and formed them into a people at Sinai, and for the 40 years in the wilderness, forming them into a nation, he's growing them from a people coming out of slavery with no real focus of worship into how you can focus on God. He gives them the law, here's how you need to worship, here's who I am, etc. And here's how I provide for you. I lead you by day and by night. I provide for you even though you might not like the provisions, but I'm taking care of you the way a parent takes care of a child. Obviously, after the 40 years in the wilderness and the conquering of the land, and now we're a couple of hundred years now into, maybe 300 years, into the kingdom being established, and they're going their own way, it's the child has grown up. The child is doing what the child wants to do, an adult child. But the parent still sees the child in a loving way as an infant. I remember comforting you and bringing you to the stage, but you're living your own life. And you're turning your back on me. In the interest of time, I'm going to go to the idea that he's going to say that he still comforts and loves them. In fact, let me go to verse 8. Because some of the, um, some of the prophecy is hard for me to understand, partly because of my lack of studying. I'll read verse 7. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. And then we have this change of heart. He says, they're determined to turn from me, even though they call me with their mouth, God most high. I will by no means exalt them. Verse 8. How can I give upon you? How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim were cities around Sodom and Gomorrah. So if you want to replace those words, how can I treat you like Sodom? How can I make you like Gomorrah? God is saying, I'm not doing this. In spite of the fact, verse 7, that you're determined to turn from me, verse 8 ends, my heart is changed within me, and all my compassion is aroused. It's a little hard to get your mind around the idea of an unchanging God changing his heart towards these people who are stiff-necked. All along, he is a God of comfort because he doesn't change. In spite of our rebelliousness. So I think of the father of the prodigal son, the story Jesus told contained in Luke chapter 15. We're not told a lot about the father except when the son returns. We're told that the father is generous and gives him what he asked for, even though it seems to be inappropriate to hand out this bequest, inheritance, while you're still alive. The child should actually pass, sorry, the father should pass and then pass out the property to his child, but he gives it to him out of love. 
The sun wastes the resources and then comes back. And the father accepts him. No questions asked. Receives him back into the family. So this is the Old Testament analogy to that parable that Jesus is telling. Here we have these people who are insisting on going their own way. The father knows it's wrong. The father goes along with it. But still is looking out for the return of the son. And here we have Hosea giving the same idea. In fact, Hosea probably originates the whole idea of the prodigal. Except this prodigal doesn't come back. But the father's heart, even though the prophecy says, my heart is changed within me and all my compassion is aroused, I'm going to, I'm not a betting man. Something is lost in translation here. This is God's heart. Not changed, but this is how God is. My heart, my compassion is what it is. And in spite of your rebelliousness, I continue to be a father to you. David, and then... I think that's what I was trying to get when we were talking about Hosea and the analysis of the, um, his wife, marrying the wife. Analogy. Maybe we're looking at it wrong, and you just summarized it. Instead of looking at the people, this is, a, this is what God... You know, this is what God is, is even though everybody's walking away and God says, keep on, keep married to that wife. Don't, how many times? Seven times seven times seven. And this is more a viewpoint of what God is, like you just said, rather than what the people are. We can't figure out what the people are are doing and the reason why. But it sure is a good analogy of what God is. Because he's sitting there going, even though you're doing the wrong thing, I still love you and I've been blessing you all along. You know? It's like, wow, if you wanted to know what God's like, you would look at this chapter and and go, oh, you know, he's more loving than I could ever imagine. And on the flip side of that coin, if you want to know what God's like, we can look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. And so, when I when you said this is like Sodom and Gomorrah, <laughs> those people didn't have a chance to come back because he utterly destroyed them. And so, there are some other things that we have to keep in mind about relationship. There's some other things, covenant. There's some other things that we have to keep in mind. And so, the Lord is showing a lot of compassion. But just the reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, knowing what happened to them, None of them are coming back because he utterly destroyed them. And if we think about these people generationally, eventually some of those tribes and the people who have become the descendants of those tribes, they're coming back. They have come back to the Lord and probably most likely through Christ and their relationship with him. Because those tribes, even though we don't know who they are anymore because they were absorbed, you have a Syrian Christians today. You have people who have come back into relationship with the Lord. I'm going to read verse 9 and then we'll try and wrap it up. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God, and not a man, the Holy One, Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. But we know that in 20-something years, it's going to fall. So how do you jive this idea that God is being merciful, gracious, compassionate toward Israel, but the end is still coming. The destruction is still coming in spite of his graciousness. Sodom and Gomorrah. Because we know when the Lord is bringing judgment, he knows how to utterly wipe you off the map. I would also say if we go back into the wilderness, when the Lord is bringing judgment, he knows how to open up the ground and swallow you up, and you are utterly destroyed. And so the fact that they are not being obliterated in this judgment means that compassion and mercy is there. Because the same Lord who is saying, I'm mercy and compassionate, that's the same God who opens up the ground and kills you. That's the same God who, who sends fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So we can't act like he's not the same God. So he knows how to obliterate you, but is choosing not to do so. I want to keep you know, focus the fact that God 
can see all of time. And he is fully knowledgeable of the fact that in 20 years, this thing is going to fold. In this scenario, we get the human side. So, because God is not a man. In fact, that's what the next verse says. I'm not a man. So I see beyond what you can see. But Hosea cannot see the way God sees. So he sees in time. And he sees that God is changing his heart. That God is not changing his heart. And that God knows what is going to happen. At some level, we have to see this as a compassionate God. So the application for us today, we know 100% of people die. No matter how much you pray for longevity, 100% of people die. There's some ends that you cannot avoid. And it doesn't mean if in your senior years you are struck with illness and hardships and unpleasantness that God is less merciful or less gracious. Some things we do not understand and we pray that we would have to suffer. Israel had to suffer. But God was gracious because the suffering could have been of a different kind. And I do not fully understand it. Judah is going to suffer. We suffer. But God is still God. And if we say many things about tomorrow, I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds the future. And I know he holds my hand. Then we can be the child in this parable, in this story, where we say, I trust you, God. Even though I don't understand what's happening to me or to us, I trust you. That complete trust should be enough to get us moving forward day by day. Many are the things I cannot understand. All about me mystery I see. But the gift most wonderful from God's own hand surely is his gift of grace to me. I do not understand why God is being so merciful. But I'm glad for mercy. For me. I'm glad for grace. For me. And I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I'll continue to hold his hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson, which reminds us a lot of our own mortality and how things work. And even when we cannot understand what's happening to us, we want to continue to trust you. We recognize that the story is about the children of Israel not trusting you and not relying on you. But may we learn the lesson that it's so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Help us to continue to be faithful, to be obedient, to continue to look to you from whence our help comes. May we write this lesson in our hearts, and may we live our lives to please you, and to tell others of your wondrous grace to the whosoever will. Thank you for our time together, and may we be blessed in what we do and say today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.